Hi, my name is Colton Williams, and I did my project, as you can see, on the accounting scandals of the early 2000s. So in the early 2000s and also the late 1990s, a huge tsunami of accounting scandals rocked the nation, more specifically in between 1998 and 2000. The most popular and most well-known instances were the scandals revolving Enron and WorldCom but there were also 24 other major corporations brought down at the same time. And they were caught in deep water whenever they were found to be doing things such as overstating revenues, understating expenses, overstating the value of corporate assets, or underreporting liabilities in an effort to boost trading and boost cash flow volumes. The SEC and the DOJ were in charge of investigating a majority of the scandals. The SEC, also known as the Securities and Exchange Commission, is an independent agency ran by the United States federal government that, according to SEC.gov in 2013, enforces the federal securities, protects investors, maintains fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and facilitates capital information. The Department of Justice, also known as the DOJ, is a federal executive department of the United States government that is responsible for the enforcement of the law and administration of justice in the United States of America. So as I stated before, Enron and WorldCom were the two major corporations that most people think of and know about whenever they hear about the early the accounting scandals of the early 2000s. So here is a timeline of Enron's scandal. You can see here in 2000, Enron reached number seven on the Fortune 500 list. On August 15, 2001, Sharon Watkins, the vice president of Enron, finds out about the accounting issues. On October 16, 2001, Enron announces a third quarter loss of $618 million. They did this in order to try to cover their tracks and fix their problems that they had had. On October 31, 2001, the SEC opens a formal investigation into Enron's transactions. On December 2nd, 2001, Enron files for bankruptcy, becoming at the time the largest in the history of the United States of America. On January 9th, 2002, the Department of Justice opens a criminal investigation into Enron's collapse. And then on January 25th, 2002, the former Enron vice, vice chairman, J. Clifford Baxter commits suicide in his mansion in Sugar Land, Texas. The result was most of the top executives were sentenced to multiple years of federal prison. As I stated before, also another top scandal that people think of whenever they think about the early accounting scandals of the early 2000s is WorldCom. WorldCom at the time was the second largest telecommunications company in the United States of America. They filed for bankruptcy in 2002, and one month later, the company compiled an internal audit of all of their transactions. And what they found was that the WorldCom had accounted for $3.8 billion worth of operating expenses that never occurred. So in response to this growing number of accounting issues, Congress passed the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. It passed in the House by a vote of 423 to 3 and in the Senate by 99 to 0. And then after that, it was signed in by President George W. Bush. The goal was to restore confidence in the accounting system by closing loopholes in recent accounting practices, strengthening corporate governance rules, increasing the accountability and disclosure requirements of corporations, increasing requirements for corporate transparency in reporting to shareholders and descriptions of financial transactions, as well as increase the requirements for corpor corporate transparency in reporting to shareholders and descriptions of financial transactions. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act is named after two men of the Senate in particular, the first being Senator Paul Sarbanes. Paul Sarbanes was a Democrat from Maryland in the House of Representatives. He was from Ohio's 4th District, 
He attended, he attended Princeton as well as Harvard to study law and afterwards served under Maryland's third district and made it his career goal to reducing the influence of the wealthy and well-connected in politics. Paul was a Democrat who served from 1977 to 2007, which made him the longest serving senator in Maryland history. The next man was Republican U.S. Congressman, best known for the, he was, who was best known for the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002, who, who reformed regulation of publicly traded companies after the Enron scandal. He served in the House of Representatives from 1981 to 2007 and was first elected in a special election to fill the vacant Ohio 4th District seat vacated by the death of Tinson Guyer. He became chairman of the House Committee in 2001 and served in that role until his retirement. And he was a 1966 graduate of Miami University and obtained his law degree from the Ohio State University in 1969. He was first an FBI special agent from 1969 to 1972 and then ran for Ohio House of Representatives from the 82nd District where he served from 1973 to 1981. Another act that was passed by Congress, and it's a mouthful, is called an Act Concerning White Collar Crime Enforcement, the Connecticut Uniform Securities Act and Corporate Fraud Accountability and Volunteer Firefighters and Members of Volunteer Ambulance Services or companies. This act made several changes to bank to banking and criminal laws regarding white collar crime enforcement and increased the penalties for bribery, hindering prostitution, or hindering prosecution and related crimes. It increased the fines for certain banking and accounting law violations and the offense levels for specific white collar crimes. It conditions financial institutions ability to affect certain transactions and part of whether they have adequate anti-money laundering programs, policies, and procedures in a record of compliance with anti-money laundering laws and regulations. The act requires all Connecticut banks, Connecticut credit unions, and broker dealers to comply with the applicable provisions of the Federal Currency and Foreign Transactions Reporting Act. It also contains provisions limiting loan obligors liabilities or imputing them to others. Many critics of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act state that even though the bill may have helped in some departments, it is far too overreaching and greatly limited, limits businesses by putting great burdens on them. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act was only supposed to affect domestic corporations. However, since the United States is such a powerful world leader on the economic scale, it caused many countries to avoid investing in the United States because they would have had to reason with the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, Oxley Act, because if they and they did that because if they would have invested in the United States, they would have to conform and they would have to establish themselves on the U.S. stock exchange. And by doing this, conflicts can arise, such as whistleblowers, because as stated before, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act gives complete protections to whistleblowers but that only applies to people in the United States. People in other countries do not get the same protections. Yet another problem coming out of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act was the increasing amount of corporations that went dark. And going dark just refers to them removing themselves from the U.S. Stock Exchange. And in fact, between the years 2003 and 2004, over 300 United States companies deregistered their common stock. The United States has also saw a rapid decline of number of total listed companies on the U.S. Stock Exchange from 1996 to 2002, with the number of companies approximately falling from 8,000 to 4,100, which is a massive drop of almost 50%. However, the rest of the world has thrived whenever we've seen our numbers drop, and the rest of the world has seen their numbers go, of numbers of businesses go from approximately 30,700 to 39,400. So although not all the blame should be put on the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, it is quite evident that since the United States has taken such a hard toll on this topic, that the Sarbanes-Oxley Act is potentially the primary reason for this decline. So to wrap it up and conclude, 
Between the years of 1998 and 2005, the world was rocked whenever a massive tsunami of accounting scandals hit the nation and came into sunlight, revolving some of the biggest corporations that our planet had ever seen. The corporation did this by overstating revenues, understating expenses, overstating the value of corporate assets, or under-reporting liabilities in effort to boost trading and boost cash flow volumes. Two United States federal oversight agencies in charge of investigating a majority of the scandals were the SEC and the DOJ. Enron, Enron, along with WorldCom, were the two largest companies brought down by the scandal, but as I said before, there were over 24 that, brought, that went tumbling down. In response to the growing amount of scandals, the United States Congress passed the Sarbanes-Oxley Act by a vote of 423 to 3 in the United States House of Representatives and by a vote of 99 to 0 in the United States Senate. And after that, the President of the United States, George W. Bush, signed it into the office. The act greatly reinstalled confidence back into the accounting system by closing loopholes in recent accounting practices, strengthening corporate governance rules, increasing accountability and disclosure requirements of corporations, especially corporate executives, and corporations' public accountants increasing requirements for corporate transparency in reporting to shareholders and descriptions of financial transactions. Even though some say that the Sarbanes-Oxley Act was far too overreaching, I believe that we can credit the Sarbanes-Oxley Act with not only saving the accounting system in our country, but saving the whole entire economy as a whole. Thank you.